Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. So good to see you today and uh, what a great day here at our church and all of our guests. I just want to say also others have welcomed you. We're so glad that you're here today. Uh, we are still learning a lot, so be patient with us. A uh, new structure and organization kind of unifying us around our connect groups and, and into worship. We've got lunch today on the lawn. So listen, let everybody come out. Texas Day Brazil is providing the lunch. And uh, so we're going to be right out here afterwards. Bring the kids. It's going to be awesome on this beautiful summer day that we have <laughs> right here. What is it? November 5th is nuts. Hey, some of you like me, um, you learned, uh, first learned, um, you know, all about finances and and uh, ruthless business practices and uh, world domination uh, by playing Monopoly. Anybody <laughs> like grow up playing this game? How many of y'all played Monopoly? All right, I know this is, I mean, it's been around a long time, but some of, you got to pass this on, parents, to your kids. This is like one of the greatest games of all time. And I remember as a kid playing this game, and it was often me up against like my older brother and a lot of his friends, and I'm getting dominated, you know. Uh, getting owned by everybody there. But most often it was like your parents or the grandmother was like the most ruthless of all. <laughs> and the whole game was all about, you know, financial acumen, right? Like, like you're going to, I'm hanging out over in Marvin Gardens, you know, or somewhere like this. Or even worse, you're over, uh, what was it? It was uh, Mediterranean Avenue, Baltic <laughs> Avenue. That's like right, one move from go. And you're like in the, it's like the ghetto. I mean, you're down, you're over there. And I'm buying up that stuff because I didn't understand the game. You know, grandmother's buying up park place, boardwalk, building houses and hotels and all kinds of stuff. So then I'm landing there and I'm giving up all my money. I mean, I'm just throwing money to everybody else. And um, what happens, though, at the end of the game, after you've, after you've made all your purchases, bought land and built stuff and have defeated, decimated your rivals, even if it's like a five-year-old kid, you know, or something... Um, you're feeling all good, but as John Ortberg notes uh, in, his, in a book entitled About the Same, uh, at the end of it all, it all goes back in the box. It all goes back in the box. And Jesus teaches us that it's possible to play the game of life where the stakes are much higher, where eternity weighs in the balance. It's possible to live that way. For an hour or two, you find yourself in this world that's seeking after more, trying to be the most successful, the most dominant one, purchasing, buying, making deals. Jesus says it's possible for your whole life to be spent doing that and to miss life altogether. And he teaches us what it means. See, here's the thing. Uh, you can see kind of the premise, the sense of this series we're walking into you're going to be owned by God or you're going to be owned by something or someone else. So really at the heart of this, what I want to talk about today, just a brief time today, uh, is worship. So I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Would you do that? Matthew 6, verses 19 through 24. Go ahead and turn there. You can kind of see where we're heading. Uh, today we're going to talk about a, a false pursuit. We're going to talk about a false prophet in a couple of weeks. Yes, the play on words. We're going to talk about false prosperity and a false promise. The premise, again, is this. You're either owned by God or you're owned by something else. There's no, there's no in-between any of this. Uh, and here in North Dallas, most often, we, it really does happen. The things that, that, that we own come to own us. And I want to talk about how this happens, why it happens, and how we can, we can live differently. Uh, before we get to Matthew 6, you know, the Bible says, um, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6. You can see it there. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Okay, so he's given, given the, the temple, I mean the spirit he's given to you. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. You're owned. So glorify God with your body. Now, a lot of people look at this verse. Christians use this verse often 
to say, well, you know, my body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why, that's why I want to stay in shape. That's why I work out five, uh, six times a week and um, I'm doing CrossFit. And all that. No, no, it's, no, you're doing that because you're obsessed with your, with your appearance. That's why you're doing that. Um, it's, okay, it's important to be healthy, but what he's saying, he's not saying that. He's actually been talking about sex, and he's saying that you cannot separate the physical from the spiritual. You can't separate the physical, watch this, location of the Holy Spirit, your body, your life, and, and that which is eternal. He, he says you can't do it. But even more, what he's saying is you have been bought with a price. The sacrificial life of Christ lived for us. We talked about this in this, this former series we were in, that he lived the perfect life on our behalf. He fulfilled the law. And he died on the cross for all of our sin, our shame, and he rose again. Acts 20, 28 says this, he has purchased us with his own blood. It's why we have uh, the Lord's Supper. We remember what he's done for us, his blood shed for us. Galatians 3, 13 says, Christ bought you with his blood and he set you free from the crushing demands of the law. And this is why we celebrate. Every time we gather, we worship. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're remembering what he's done. And we are owned by him. If you're a Christian, if you've received this grace. So let's talk about it. Owned by a false pursuit. Uh, Jesus says it's possible to live your life and to miss it altogether. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. I hope you have it there in front of you. He says this. Now, he's right in the middle of the... Um, of the Sermon on the Mount. So he's talking about what does the gospel look like in real life? What does it mean to be a, a follower of Christ, to have received his grace, and then live uh, in response to that, which we would call worship? It's a life of worship. So he says this. He gets to, he's been walking about, I mean, he's been talking about caring for the poor and praying and fasting and what all this looks like. And then he gets to this thing of money and the whole crowd, collective sigh. Do not, listen to this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then here it is. Look at this verse 21. Many of you have seen this verse. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. One of the most profound statements in all of scripture about worship. Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, okay, if you have poor vision, or if you're blind, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Everything's dark. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, that word money is the word mammon. Maybe you've seen that. It's, it's a word that is it's more than money. It's, it's all that money and the pursuit of money entails. We might call it uh, materialism in our day. In fact, an online definition. Look at this. Materialism is a preoccupation. Think about that. How our occupation become a preoccupation, a, an obsession with or emphasis on material objects, comforts, and considerations. And then look at this. With a disinterest in or rejection of spiritual, intellectual, or cultural values. Even the definition implies. This is not, that's not from the Bible. Even the definition of materialism, mammon, which becomes a god that we worship, even the definition implies that you can't serve both. You can't serve materialism and something else. This is what Jesus says, of course. So here's what this passage teaches us. Real simple today. Uh, what it is to be owned by a false pursuit. First, how materialism owns us. Okay, you can say money or mammon. Why materialism owns us and then how to be owned by God. All right? So this is a very challenging passage. So I'm trusting in a very short period of time, God's spirit is speaking as you're open now, listening to him. First, how materialism owns us. This is verses 19 through 21. Notice that he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. He doesn't say, don't store up treasure. He says, store up treasure. But focus on where your treasure is being, being, being focused, where it's being stockpiled. Where are you treasuring? Where are you laying it up? He says, don't lay it up here 
uh, on earth or the stuff that is temporal. Instead, lay it up in heaven, if you will, all that's eternal. Now, why does he say, it's real simple. Why store up in heaven and not here? Uh, kids, parents, sorry. But what he's saying, basically, it's stupid. That's why. It's stupid to store up something that is going to disappear. It's going to be gone. It all goes back in the box. Jesus says, why would you do that? And yet we all do it. He says, instead, listen, focus on the eternal things. And then he makes that statement, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And we all treasure. And here's what I want you to think about with me. Our treasure is whatever we value above uh, everything else. The Bible calls it an idol, a little g, God. It's anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give what only God can give you. Think with me. An idol is whatever you look at and say, if I had that. If deep in your heart of hearts you said, if I had that, I would have meaning in my life. If I had that, I would find that I have significance and value. I would be okay. And if you're, if you're tracking with me here, if, you, if you're allowing the Spirit to speak to you, it's anything that you feel that you need to be significant and secure. There's a lot of ways we could describe a relationship that you would have with something like that, but the best word is worship. Whatever you treasure, that's where your heart will be. That's where your focus will be. It's where your energies, your thought life I've said it this way. It's where your deepest emotions will run. This is why, listen, diagnostic question uh, that helps you. What are my anxieties and my worries, my fear, my deepest emotions? Things that make me angry. Things that make me really happy. Things that I stay up at night thinking about. How does that point me to my idol and what I worship? Your anxieties and your worry point you to what you worship. Jesus is saying the heart will point you there. It's what you focus on. It what makes you happy. Maybe you get energetic when you talk about it. It's your obsession. And for all of us, listen, it may not be God. We may say that it is, but as we'll see here in a moment, it's very insidious. It's why we can't, can't pinpoint it often. It's a very challenging thing. So what is it for you? Young people, for you, I know for, gosh, for some who are in high school or even some of our single adults, you know, my, well, it's, if I had a boyfriend, I, I, I know that I would have value. If I had a girlfriend, I'd know that I am, I'm a stud, I am somebody, right? If I, had a, if, I could, if I could only get married, I would know that I have value in this world. Young people, listen, single adults, married adults, your value, if you've received Christ, is determined by him and him alone. Not by another person who will, by the way, let you down. Who will not be... Uh, listen, your, your spouse may be awesome. They're not God. And they make a lousy God. Because your spouse, every person on the planet, and parents, listen, even your children, they will let you down. I've told you before, if you place your children at the center of your life for value, worth, and significance, they will crush you. And you will crush them. Because God will have no other gods before him. And so he is gracious and kind when we seek after things that are not him. He allows us to be crushed by those things. It's happened in my life and it happens in all of our lives. For you, it might be money. It might be a house. It might be the next job. It might be retirement for some of us who are older. It might be a 501k. Man, if I could just be comfortable, secure, if I know I'm going to be all right, and that becomes the obsession of your life. It might be a dress size. It might be your reputation. What is it? Young people, listen, what is it? It's seeking the approval of others. It's, it's performance in a certain area of your life. What is it for you? See, Jesus says... This is how materialism owns you. It captures your heart and it directs your life. This is big stuff. Secondly, why materialism owns you? He, he tells us why. Have you noticed that verse 22 and 23, did you catch this? You read this and you kind of go, wait, he's talking about money. Okay, verse 19 through 21. He gets back to it in 24. But what is this? 
in the middle. The eye is the lamp of the body. It's central to his teaching here. The eye is the window of the soul is what he's saying. And he's saying that some sin can blind us. Some sin you don't see. How dark is it that you cannot see? And the one that he's referencing here is greed. I've said this before. As a pastor, I have a lot of people who come and confess their sin to me. And, um, you know, it's a, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to talk about the grace of God. I'll have people confess sin that they've never confessed to anybody. Grown adult people who've carried some burden. I've had, I never had anyone sit in my office and say, I am the greediest person I know, and it's killing me. Because we're blind to it. Think about it. Other sins um, don't murder. Well, we know if we've murdered somebody, right? Um, don't steal. You know if you've stolen from somebody. Don't commit adultery. You know, you don't go, whoa, you're not my spouse. How did that happen? You don't do that. Nobody does that. You know when you, when you sin, but greed is so insidious, we don't see it. Materialism owns us because we can't see it. Unless you're sitting here on a Sunday morning and you're listening and hearing the word of God taught and preached and then the light starts to come on. I'm praying that's happening for you. We're all prone to run somewhere. Who is it? Where is it? Name it. Because only when you do and deal with it, confess it and repent of it, do you turn and worship God alone where you find life and joy and, yes, peace and a non-anxious presence of the Spirit that fills you up. Contentment. Isn't that what we all want more than anything else? You know, there's an interesting passage in Romans 3, um, and, it, and it talks about how at times God gives us over to the things that we desire the most. Now think about this. Why is getting your heart's desire so often a disaster? And if you've been around long enough, some of you have experienced this. Why would the greatest punishment imaginable be to allow someone to achieve their fondest dreams and then to be crushed by them? Listen, God is gracious and loving to allow us to run after the dreams of our hearts that are not him and to be crushed by them so that we will turn to him and find that in him alone do we have meaning and purpose and love and joy and all that life, real life, can bring to us. Some of you are walking through this right now. Because listen, if it's not God, it will ruin you. Only Christ, he alone is the one that we can worship who will not crush us. I don't care how loving your spouse is, how great your kids are, how wonderful your job is. Christ alone fulfills us, and he is gracious and kind to allow us to see that. That's what he's saying. Open your eyes. The eye is the lamp to the body. And then finally, I'll close with this. How can we then be owned by God? Well, here's what he says in verse 24. You can only have one first. Uh, this past week, I, I taught our men's Bible study. We looked at, at a little further, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. You could say, there's only one first, one priority. This is what Jesus is saying. You can't have two masters. You only have one. And why is it that we would hate the one as we seek to love the other? Well, here's what happens. One of the signs that an object is, is functioning as an idol is that fear is one of the chief characteristics of your life. And a lot of us live with an anxiety and a fear and worry. And again, they should point us, these emotions should point us to our idol. What makes you really sad? What makes you happy? And here, what makes you angry? Because anger is often the fear of losing something. And some people live with this undercurrent of anger. Maybe your spouse sees it, your kids see it. It should point you to your God. And then he says, you will hate God, if you're pursuing something other than him. Now, we, we know in church circles, you don't, you certainly don't say that. I hate God. He's standing in the way of my idol. But that's exactly why we hate him. Because he will not have any other God before him 
first commandment for our good and to his glory. There's only one first. Listen, how do you know? Let's close with this. How do you know if money has power? Now, how about this? How do you know if money has no power over you? You no longer envy rich people. And you honor and respect and love poor people. And, and we all, here's the thing. This is what's so crazy. Studies have been done. People, people are millionaires and they think, nah, I'm not that rich. Because we all know somebody who's richer. We all have like a family member or somebody who's much more extravagant with their money. They're making a lot more money than we are. And even in our context in North Dallas, the one percentile of population on the planet. And a lot of us are like, oh, I wish I lived in that house down the street down there. I wish I had that car. That, man, if I had that job. Now, that guy's rich. I'm not, but that guy is. And it's all relative because we all seek more. And so often we envy those who are wealthy. But watch this. This is not just for wealthy people. If you're poor and you think, if I could only have this much money, or if I could have what that guy has, I would be fine. I would finally be significant, a person of value. Listen, that's the pursuit of mammon. That's an idol. You know that mammon has not captured your heart if you no longer envy others who have more than you and you respect and honor, watch this, and want to learn from those who don't have as much as you. And then the third and final way is one that you could guess if you thought about it long enough. You're a giver. The solution to, to the pursuit of mammon and greed is to be a giver. That's how you know. But it's also the solution. For you to give, to be a giver, and to be a radical giver. To be radically generous. Now, I, confessionally, when I, when I chose this text for the message today, I wasn't thinking intentionally, this is going to be about money. But that's what this text is about. And to be true to the text means that Jesus is saying, listen, if you want to release yourself of the pursuit of mammon, then you've got to remember what I have done for you. Because a lot of people, we wrestle with, what do we give? How much do I give? You know what? If you have the Spirit of God living in you, that's a prayer before God Almighty for you to seek Him with an honest heart, an open heart, and say, Lord, what would you have me give? That's between you and the Lord. Now, we often talk about the 10%, the tithe being the standard, and that's a good place to start. And many of us can't get there. Uh, but we, we need to because it's good for you. Because we can't see greed, but if we can give, it, dis, it, it just it, it dispels all of the challenges that we have and the anxieties and worries if we become givers. But here's the thing. In the end, 10% is not really the standard. The cross is the standard. Because here's what it says. Look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus treasured you. He treasures you now, but he treasured you sacrificially. You are his treasure. He's the one who gave up all that he has for you. And so our response to him, here it is, how to be owned by him. I'll summarize with this and we'll close. Recognize that Jesus lost all of his treasure to make you his. Respond to his grace by allowing him alone to be your master. Rejoice in the freedom he brings by transferring your treasure from the earthly temporal to the eternal. And then rest in the reality that all you need you have found in him. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to close in prayer. And we're just going to close our time by giving our hearts and our life to the Lord. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I just want to guide us in prayer. We're not going to sing out. We're going to close our time now. So what is the Spirit saying to you today? Friend, listen, you don't need more stuff. You don't need a better job, certain dress size or reputation, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. Some of you think, if I only had kids, if I had a child. You don't need more stuff. You need more of him. Because Christ alone is the one who brings meaning and significance and purpose to your life. 
And he alone will not ruin you. Because he alone is God. Lord, show us. May we think more deeply about this. That we would allow your spirit to point us to our idols. And that we would wrestle with those things. Confess those to you and to others. And be held accountable. That we might pursue you with all that we have. Teach us, Lord, what that means, what that looks like. Teach us what we are to hold on to and what we are to give away. Let us be radically generous people because of the radical generosity that we have received in Christ and in him alone. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you gave up your treasure so that you would make us your treasures. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.